Great, and uh, welcome to Blogging Theology. And uh, this is a very special uh, a time and edition where I welcome uh, Professor David Thomas, um, who uh, is uh, an Emeritus Professor of Christianity and Islam at the University of Birmingham in, in England. Also the Nadir Dinshaw Professor of Interreligious Relations. And uh, you are most welcome, sir, to Blogging Theology. Well, thank you very much. It's very good, uh, very good to be here. Um, as you say, I'm emeritus professor. Um, I'm retired now. I live quite a distance from um, Birmingham. I live down in the West Country, um, and I'm attached to the cathedral at Wells as um, canon theologian. Wow. So the Wells is a very ancient, isn't it, cathedral, a venerable cathedral that goes back many, many centuries, I think. I think it goes back to the 12th century. 12th century. Wow, that is, that's amazing. Uh, well, you're most welcome, sir. And um, I, I, as we know, we're going to talk uh, today uh, a little bit about um, the astonishing discovery of, uh, of fragments of the Quran uh, at the University of Birmingham. And it hit the, the headlines globally. The New York Times had an article on it and the BBC covered it. And, um, and it was radiocarbon dated with a probability of more than 95%, I understand, to uh, a, a range, a spectrum of dates from 568 AD to 645 AD. The, the 568 being the earliest possible date for those fragments to 645 AD. And Muhammad himself, of course, uh, uh, died in 632 uh, AD. Um, so the date of the parchment, uh, which I understand contains surahs 18 through to 20, is incredibly early. It's one of the earliest fragments we have in the world. Um, can I ask you firstly, when this was discovered, I mean, for you personally, this must have been enormously impactful, given your professional interest in the Quran and, uh, and, and Muslim Christian relations. How did it affect folk at, at Birmingham? What, what was it like, oh my goodness me, this is, this is absolutely amazing. Well, it's, it's curious, isn't it? Um, in libraries, all over the world, large libraries especially, um, lie items that have gone unnoticed for many, many years. Mm. Um, it appears that this, the, these leaves of the Quran uh, came to the library in, I believe, the 1920s. Mm. They were purchased from the library and they were left there. And as academic interests changed, so it turned out that people weren't able to read them, they didn't know what they were, and eventually they were uh, bound together uh, to keep them safe with some other manuscript versions of the Quran. These are rather later, and right. it was only about six years ago that um, they came to the notice of a research student. Um, and she persuaded the uh, research part of the library to have them dated because she suspected, on the basis of um, some comments from a, an earlier scholar, she suspected that these were very early leaves of the Quran indeed. Mm. Um, and that is where it all began. Mm. Um, I, I should say that, as you've pointed out, um, it's only a very small part of the Quran that we're talking about here. These are only two leaves of the Quran, uh, yeah. making up four pages, and they only contain parts of surahs uh, 19 and 20, uh, I think. So we're not dealing with a, a whole Quran. That is why they're called the Birmingham Quran leaves. Right. Now, they must have had a very high status because they are written on parchment, which is animal skin. And the preparation of parchment is a very involved process, making it a very costly process. Uh, the skin of either a sheep or a goat would be used, um, and it would be rubbed and rubbed and rubbed and scrubbed in order to, first of all, clean it, to remove as much hair as possible, and to make it as thin as possible. Um, because, of course, uh, it will last much longer than almost any other substance. Um, would you like me to, 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 to continue the story? Oh, please. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, just, I'm, I'm just captivated. Please continue. Okay. Well, um, yes. 
the parchment being animal yes. will contain carbon. Right. Um, you and I, our bodies contain carbon. Every living thing contains carbon. Yes. And part of that carbon is radioactive. A small element of that carbon will be radioactive. And when the organism carrying the carbon dies, that small radioactive part begins to decay. Um, and so it has been possible now for a number of decades to measure the amount of carbon and the amount of decayed carbon, and so to use that to work out the date when that organism died, whether it was a tree or an animal or whatever. Right. So a very small fragment, um, in fact, a semi-detached corner of one of the leaves was sent to um, Oxford for radiocarbon dating. Right. It didn't carry any text. It was no. part of, let's say, of the it's corner. Just the, the actual parchment itself, but not the, the actual date of the writing, if that was a different date, is actually a separate subject, is it not? But we're talking here about the, the vellum, the actual animal skin that's been treated in the way you say. Uh, because some people have said, well, the date of writing could be quite different. I know it's a different subject, but just to be clear, we're talking here about the actual fragment itself and not the date of the writing of the Quran itself. Precisely. Uh, on, precisely. on it. Right. Yes. Now, um, as you say, the as you as you just said, the the parchment dates from a remarkably early period. Um, they, they can never give a precise year for this study based on this process, but it looks as though the animal from which the parchment, the skin was taken, as you say, died sometime in the period between uh, 568 and 645. When you th think, uh, as you just said, when you think that the Prophet Muhammad died in the year 632, yes. there is a possibility, and I must underline that, there is a possibility that the animal was living during the Prophet's lifetime. And if it was killed and the parchment produced um, as late as 645, that would make for a very early period, very early date, in the early Islamic period. It would be during the lifetime of the third uh, caliph, um, Osman ibn Affan. Yes. And this is, where the, uh, this is where the sensation came from, because uh, when, when the publicity went around, it was thought that there was a possibility that this was a Quran or these leaves came from a Quran of a much earlier date than anything else uh, that is known. Um, and so there was a huge amount of publicity, um, and rightly so, because these are very important uh, documents. I should say that they're not by any means the only documents uh, of this kind. There are leaves from Qurans in Paris, in St. Petersburg and elsewhere, that can also be dated to a very early period. You mentioned Paris, of course, but um, I, I read somewhere that these uh, uh, parchments we're discussing now uh, could well be part of a collection, a larger collection of leaves in Paris. In fact, they're, they're, although those Paris manuscripts have not been dated, the uh, the writing style, perhaps the appearance, suggests actually that they belong together uh, as a as a originally a whole single Quran. Is that right? Or? This has been suggested. I believe it's there are thirty four leaves from uh, this same Quran uh, in Paris in the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, yes. um, and these two leaves somehow became detached at some period. Right. Um, but it looks as if, as if uh, from the style of the writing that um, they they come from the same Quran. So um, the dating is not just by radiocarbon dating; it's also by the writing style as well. It's the same for the New Testament. I understand the the, the way that uh, New Testament fragments can be uh, dated and placed is by the writing style as well. So this is quite a key way, isn't it, that scholars use to 
uh, you know, determine the, the, the historical dating of the exactly. text. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Every when in the period we're talking about, just as in the New Testament period, uh, in the first second centuries um, of the Common Era, um, there would of course be no printing presses, no. and everything was copied by hand. Yes, and there would be professional scribes, and each would have um, his own style of writing. Yeah. And if you're lucky, sometimes. Um, in certain cases, you're able to tell who the scribe was uh, because of other documents that resemble this very much. Yeah. Um, the style of writing on the uh, parchment that we're talking about is a very early style. It is known as the Hejazi style of writing. The Hejaz uh, is a region in Western Arabia where yeah. The cities of Mecca and Medina are found. And there are a, a number of documents um, that can be dated to the seventh century. Now, that is uh, within 50, 60 years of the death of the Prophet. Um, and the writing is a kind of writing called Kufic. It's a style called Kufic, a very angular style. Yeah. And it's known as Hejazi, coming from that, uh, coming from that area. Um, so this bit looks like a, a, it could well have been perhaps part of the uh, of Uthman's um, Quran. Could, could Uthman put together almost like a definitive uh, Quran, did he not? There's the skeletal structure for various reasons because people were concerned in the wider Islamic empire that the the purity uh, of the uh, the Quranic uh, revelation was being compromised by uh, you know uh, uh, people who weren't speaking. Um, the, the Arabic as they were in Arabia, and so he created this definitive um, uh, text. Uh, and and could, could this be one of these texts? I mean, uh, apparently, a number of them were sent out to parts of the Islamic uh, world uh, as kind of the touchstone by which authentic and correct recitation should be made. Is it possible this is one of those texts? Well, if only it were. I mean, you've. Um related the uh, the traditional story that yeah. the definitive um, compilation of the Quran was made um, in about the year 650 under mm -hmm. the Caliph uh, Osman. Uh, there are uh, accounts of this in early Islamic uh, histories. Um, and as you say, uh, he was trying to counter the threat to the integrity of the Quran because in various parts of the uh, early Islamic Empire, people seem to have different versions of, um, of, of what the Quran was saying. Uh, well, if, if these leaves are from an Uthmanic Quran, they're, they're, they're priceless. But the question is, when was the writing put onto the parchment yes. leaves? Now, as yeah. I've just said, the parchment comes from a very early uh, date. Was the parchment used immediately? Say it was, but the animal was killed in 645. Let's take that date, the, the one of the dates given, uh, the yeah. end range given by the Oxford, um, uh, the, the Oxford testers. Yeah. Uh, say the animal was killed in about 645. Um, was the parchment then? It would be produced within weeks, months of the death of the animal, of the animal being killed. Was the writing, was it used for for writing immediately, or was it used? Was it stored? Um, we do. We simply do not know. Um, but what, what, why, so, would they, in trouble, why would they go to all the trouble? And you've given a quite a detailed explanation of the killing of the animal, the dehairing of it, the thinning it of, uh, of the the text out. Why would they go to all that trouble and then just throw it away for years? Uh, I, 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 given that you know this was an, a, a, not a rich empire at that stage, it was you know why would they go to all that trouble unless they were going to use it to order for a particular purpose in mind from the beginning? I, I, what would be the reason for them storing something like that for the future? Um, yes, no you, would, you would assume that uh, within the Islamic Empire, um, parchment would be produced to order, yeah. um, and it would be used almost immediately. Yes. Um, I have heard 
the suggestion put forward that this, the parchment for this Quran, in fact, was not prepared by Muslims. Um, they, it may have been prepared in a monastery, um, some some place somewhere in the Middle East, um, and in monasteries, you know, there would be scriptoria, uh, writing rooms where copying was done on a daily basis, copying right. of uh, Christian texts, uh, especially the Bible, and there would always be a store of parchment uh, right. needed for this. And it's not impossible that a, an early Islamic raiding party uh, took the, the, the supply of parchment and uh, it was taken into the Islamic Empire. We, we, right. we, we simply do not know. It would be completely... No. Um, but you said the writing style, the Hijazi uh, script suggests a very early provenance, an early date nonetheless. So we're not, we, we have that as an indication. A date some, somewhere, conservatively speaking, uh, maybe around 700, 720. Now that right. is very early indeed. And those, that, that is the date given to the uh, Paris, to the leaves in Paris which, as you say, have not been subjected to carbon. They've uh, not been carbon no. um, But that, of course, places this Quran, that would place these Quran leaves um, maybe 40, 50 years later than right. the date that was first given them, that caused all the sensation. We simply do not know. And as you were saying, why not test the ink? Why can't we test the ink? Well. As far as I know, at the moment, there is no test yeah. that yeah. contains the age of ink because ink is a compound and right. the uh, radiocarbon testing would only give you a date for the elements, the yeah. separate elements in the compound. Now, the yeah. main element in uh, the compound of this ink um, is charcoal and uh, the testing would tell you when the tree from which the charcoal, uh, the charcoal was made um, when that tree was felled. But of course, the wood might have been lying around for quite a while yeah, uh, yeah. before it was turned into charcoal and the yeah. uh, produced. So uh, the, the, the acid test, if I could put it like that, would be yeah. to know the date of the ink. But as far as I uh, am informed, up to now, the, uh, a, the date of the ink has not been acid to know. No. Okay, the, the next question inevitably is the uh, the parchment we have, early as it is, how does it compare with modern 21st century Qurans in terms of the text? Is it broadly speaking the same text or is it very different or uh, how, how, how has that been evaluated by scholars? If I remember correctly, um, I think there are one or two scribal errors, but substantially the text that we have on these four pages, and I do stress that it is a very small sample of the Quran. Um, the, the text that we have is is identical with the received text. Um, right. So uh, there is no indication that the text has undergone any development, you might say, any developed in writing. It looks as if the style that the Quran uh, appeared in in the seventh century is the same as as we have now so there's so very little to tell on a very very little to say uh, there's, there's, no, there's nothing scandalous there's nothing to shock the muslim world about uh, uh, a different quran from that time uh, compared to today's not on the basis of this evidence no, no. so if if we combine the birmingham manuscripts with the one uh, the larger collection in university of, in paris that it originally formed a part of can we legitimately extrapolate that the whole, all of the chapters of the Quran, can we infer that they would have all have been the same then as they are now? Can one make that extrapolation legitimately without having seen them? Because if we've got a reliable, say, 20% of the Quran, can we therefore generalize and say, well, it's very likely then that all of the Quran would have been the same? You see what I mean? Well, as an academic, I, I would say it's it's risky to do that. Um, there, it's possible, it is possible that in one or two places, for um, ideological reasons, 
words or phrases will have been changed in order to change the meaning of the Quran. Um, and so it's very difficult, unless you have an entire Quran, to say, uh, to, to, to make the kind of statements that you are, you are making. I think the majority of scholars who work on the Quran, I should stress by the way that um, I and myself do not work on the text of the Quran. Um, the, the majority of scholars who work on the text of the Quran would say that there are very, very few signs that the text has been changed in any systematic way. Uh, there is no tarif, if I can use the Arabic word, uh, that we, evident in the Qurans that we have, in the early Qurans. That so, well, the differences that do exist, I suppose, would be comparable to the differences we see in New Testament manuscripts that are copied by hand from scribe to scribe over the centuries. You're inevitably going to get, you know, uh, scribal errors and things like that, but we're not dealing with any uh, substantial differences. Just the, the expected uh, issues that would arise from handwritten manuscripts copied and copied and copied over, over time. In the case of uh, New Testament, uh, manuscripts, especially gospel manuscripts, there are what, what are known as families of manuscripts. Uh, these are manuscripts that seem that bear similar features that are not evident in other manuscripts. And um, it would seem that these are uh, manuscripts that were copied from a particular master manuscript, and they all bear the same resemblance. So that, if we knew more about the Quran, and I, I think we, we're not at a stage where we can talk about this, we would possibly also be able to identify uh, families uh, of Quran copies. Um, but that of, course, that, of course, presupposes that there are enough um, early Qurans from the 7th, early 8th century around uh, surviving to enable us to uh, to, 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 to identify various families. That's yep. that's possibility. Okay. Well, that's extremely interesting. Uh, but before we move on, because I wanted to also discuss briefly with you uh, Christian Muslim, Muslim relations today and the challenges facing that. But is there anything else you want just to add about the, the Birmingham Quran uh, before we move on? Well, I think we have to be very, very careful uh, uh, in trying to make definitive statements. Um, it's very exciting to think that the parchment, that the animal from which the parchment came, um, could have been living at the time of the Prophet Muhammad. And it's, you could deduce from that that if the Quran was actually copied out onto that parchment as soon as the animal was killed, that the scribe will have possibly been alive during the time of the Prophet's lifetime. But this is speculation, and um, I am persuaded by scholars who would place these leaves together with leaves that have been dated much later in the seventh century. Right. But we're talking about Qurans that come from within a century of the death of the Prophet. Uh, don't let's uh, diminish the importance of that. They're very, very early attestations to the uh, text of the Quran. Uh, but we must be very careful about making definite statements. Yeah. There's so much we don't know uh, that we, we shouldn't bring together um, what we, the little that we do know and say that we, that we have some definite facts. Because the, the, the other way, or even the main way, the Quran was transmitted uh, from Muslim to Muslim, right from the, the beginning or almost, is, is orally. It, it was a verbal recitation. The very name Quran itself in Arabic suggests uh, a recitation rather than just a, a manuscript or a parchment. And so um, that, that would have been uh, through many, many thousands, tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of people would have learned the Quran and, and passed it on orally rather than having their own personal copy, everyone having their own personal copies. Yes. yes yeah. 
Uh, and obviously, we, we can't recover that because that was something that was in people's hearts and minds rather than a written text. Uh, okay, well, that's fascinating. But perhaps we could just move on to uh, perhaps a much more difficult subject in a way, um, the uh, the current challenges to Christian Muslim relations. But I, I didn't mean in terms of the ongoing geopolitical issues, which we all know about from the daily news, but I meant in terms of theology and faith, um, because uh, Muslims, in my experience, don't always understand correctly what uh, Christians believe, uh, and, and maybe vice versa as well. Christians not always understanding uh, uh, about Islamic faith and also the diversity that exists. There's one thing I don't think, put it this way, Muslims often, even normally, in my experience, what it's worth, don't understand the sheer diversity of practice and beliefs that exist in the Christian world today, let alone historically, so that they may have um, fairly stereotyped understandings of the Bible bashing missionary um, and, and perhaps not be aware of uh, the enormous amount of uh, activity from Roman Catholic missionaries, shall we say, in Africa uh, and the Far East, which is much less proselytizing, shall we say, and more centered on, I don't know, caring for the poor and, and so on. So th th there are these kind of tropes that, that figure without really appreciating the incredible diversity that exists in the modern Christian world, let alone historically, but also perhaps vice versa, that many Christians have uh, uh, fairly binary views of, of what Muslims are like. So whether it be the, the terrorist Muslim of uh, perhaps North American evangelical fears, uh, but then you get the Sufis and then you get uh, uh, more modernist Muslims and then you get more secular Muslims and you get I mean, the list is very long. Uh, so perhaps it's a difficult question just to focus the challenges to Muslim Christian relations, given the complexity and the diversity that exists within these two world religions. Oh, there are so many, so many, so many things to say here. Um, I wonder whether I could start by making the statement that Christian Muslim relations are probably the most complicated relations between faiths in the world. The reason is that in the religious texts of the two faiths, the Bible and um, the Quran, the same figures appear. Um, if we look at the Quran, for example, uh, figures such as Noah, Abraham, Moses, David, John the Baptist. Um, today, by the way, the Christian churches are celebrating the birth of John the Baptist, the 24th of June. Um, and so it's very easy for Christians and Muslims to assume they're talking about the same figures. Um, the figure of Jesus appears in the Quran as well, but if you look closely, the figure of Jesus is rather a different figure uh, from the figure of Jesus in the Bible. There is uh, the virgin birth in both the Quran and the Bible. But whereas in the Bible there is the possibility and some explicit statements from Jesus himself about his closeness to God, his oneness with God, that have led Christians to see that this is not just the closeness of um, a man to his, to his uh, deity, but it is a closeness of an organic kind, you might say, a closeness that makes them one. And from this comes the Christian doctrine of the Trinity. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In the Quran, Jesus is quite definitely a human being. He is a messenger of God who has been sent by God, and by implication, because he's been sent by God, he is God's agent, God's instrument, um, and therefore subordinate to God and different from God. And in Surah 5 of the Quran, at the end of Surah 5, Jesus actually denies that he's ever claimed to be divine. Yeah. And supremely in the Quran, uh, Jesus does not die. And the central action 
of Jesus, you might say, in the Gospels is that he is executed on the cross in Jerusalem, just outside Jerusalem, and he returns to life. And um, a whole array of Christian doctrines have been based upon that event. In the yeah. Quran, um, there is a simple statement in chapter 4, Surah 4, um, they did not kill him, they did not crucify him. Uh, whatever that means. Well, they appear, or they appear to them that uh, it's addressing the Jews here, of course, and their uh, calumny against uh, Mary and their killing of the prophets. And their, and in their boast, they said, we're, we're, you know, we killed the Messiah. Uh, but the Quran says, no, they did, they did not crucify him, although it appeared to them that it was so, or, or whatever you translate that slightly enigmatic uh, Arabic, of course, and that's been the subject of much discussion in the Islamic tradition. Uh, you yes. know, did, did Jesus actually die, or, or was it was it just saying that the Jews didn't do it, thus leading over the possibility that he was crucified anyway, uh, and so on? Or was he substituted or, uh, with, with someone else, maybe Judas? Uh, there's Israeli act, these traditions that come in to fill out the, the story, which is quite simple and unadorned in the Quran, and uh, yeah, we, we want to know more, uh, you know. From exactly. Yeah. Uh, it's a single verse in the Quran, yeah. nothing more is said. Uh, the, the point is, though, that um, because of the very close um, accounts uh, of figures, including Jesus, in the Bible and the Quran, um, Christians and Muslims have tended to think that um, Muslims have thought Christianity is a version of their, is a, a precursor of Islam. And Christians have thought that Islam is a version of Christianity. Yes, yes. Therefore, Christians have always tended to, well, always, they probably, the great majority have, have tended to see Islam as a kind of divergent form of Christianity. Well, and Christian heresy, wasn't it? Because John of Damascus, famously, the earliest Christian theologian, to comment extensively on this, called it a Christian heresy. I even remember a Catholic priest friend of mine a few years ago saying, uh, you know, well, we, we view Islam as a Christian heresy. And I thought, wow, that's an interesting way of putting it. Um, that's right, that's right. It, um, it, uh, he, he's very scathing about, about it. And of course, on the other side, Muslims have tended to see Christianity as um, a deficient form of Islam. Uh, that Christians have lost the uh, original teachings of Jesus um, and they haven't seen that Jesus was, first of all, um, anticipating the coming of uh, Muhammad and that Jesus was much more, uh, he, he resembled Muhammad much more than Christianity will allow it to be. Um, right. So all through the ages, and it's as uh, pro problematic now as it has been, Christians and Muslims have tended to see each other as a version of themselves, and all kinds of problems have arisen because of that. But I think maybe in the medieval, in the European medieval world, I should say, the uh, the misunderstandings of Islam were much more severe. It was thought that uh, Muslims were polytheists uh, who worshipped Muhammad as a god, I and mean, there's very little real information. It was only perhaps uh, with the Renaissance and the beginning of uh, actual close study of the text themselves, the translating of the Quran into Latin and ultimately even into English, that serious study of the Quran began and people realized that a lot of these medieval Christian myths were outrageous lies. I mean, they're, they're, obviously, you know, Islam, Muslims have never preached mo uh, polytheism, the idea that Muhammad was a god, and I forget the names of the other entities that were supposedly uh, inhabiting this polytheistic universe. So. Uh, there were severe misunderstandings, but all the Muslim side as well, there have been uh, misunderstandings as well, as you say, about uh, the other side, so to speak. I think it was probably the period of the Crusades that mm -hmm. caused as much um, mayhem in, in uh, Christian attitudes towards Islam as, as anything else. Um, you're referring to uh, Muslims as polytheists. Um, it's because in the you have to say ignorance of, Christ, of, of European Christians about um, Islam. They assumed, going back to the point I was making just now, they assumed that be, just be, that because Christians worshipped 
Trinity, the Muslims yeah. worship an infernal trinity of Mahound, Apollyon, and Timogen. That those ah, are the three. Oh, yeah, yes. Thank you for remembering them, yes. yes. They're referred to. Um, that is projecting from one faith onto another, onto the other. Mm -hmm. And as I say, that has happened all through Christian Muslim history. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, I would say it's as true now as ever. Um, what Muslim has bothered to read the Bible and what Christian has, probably read, pro has, has bothered to read the Quran, uh, it just doesn't happen. It, it does not happen. Uh, so the, the re, there are these two different projections of true faith. Uh, and, and because the other is seen as deficient um, in, in, in their faith, uh, there, there is this constant misunderstanding. Well, this is a very pessimistic um, assessment of the state of affairs. Uh, I'm not saying you're wrong. But I will, ca if I may, caveat it a little bit. Uh, I've had the immense privilege uh, not to speak, not only just speaking to people like you, but other eminent scholars, people like Keith Ward, Dale Martin, the theologians and biblical scholars who strongly identify as Christians, but most of them are ordained uh, in the Church of England, like yourself. And they've all read not only the Bible, obviously, but the Quran, uh, that they have a, an educated, nuanced understanding of. Mohammed and uh, everyone that I've asked, I think everyone apart from one, uh, um, has actually said that they believe Mohammed is a prophet of God as well. So they, they've crossed that divide. I mean, Keith Ward, for example, reached Professor Divinity at Oxford, uh, he retired, uh, has said to, to me uh, very openly that he believed uh, God sent Mohammed uh, to preach monotheism, Tawheed, uh, even to Christians. That's what he said. Um, in, in that at that time, um, with, with uh, the councils and so on having taken place, and um, so I, th there seems to be this chasm, this gulf between, as you as you say, you know, the the, the how can I put it, the, the man on the street. That's not meant to be patronising, you know, in the Muslim world and perhaps in the Christian world, not even perhaps being that familiar at all with the with the opposite side scriptures. But the ulama, the, well, the Christian ulama, if I can use that term. Uh, that I've spoken to at least, uh, uh, yourself being an obvious example, are very familiar. You, you can quote the Arabic of the Quran and uh, you know the verses and so on. So there seems to be this huge gulf between uh, the experts on your own side of the Christian world and the man on the street who perhaps knows very little of anything at all about but, uh, the, the other side's faith. Well, if we're going to talk about Christian attitudes towards Islam, there are inherited attitudes uh, that Christians would accept uh, about Muhammad being um, some sort of fraud, the Quran being a Christian, a, a, a pastiche of Christian, um, of, of Christian scripture. And I would say that is lurking there in the background when most people yeah. think of Islam. And of course that's compounded by the fact and, and, and um, supported by the fact of um, what seems to be Muslim aggressiveness. We're looking at Al-Qaeda, uh, ISIS, etc. It confirms in the, in the minds of most people that yeah. Islam is a faith that is totally different from Christianity. And if it's so different from Christianity, then Muhammad cannot possibly be an authentic, uh, uh, authentic um, uh, instrument of God, if I can put it like that. But if I can say, um, there has been what we might call a minority view from quite early on amongst Christians. Um, if you think of it from a, a theological point of view, it is very difficult to accommodate Muhammad within um, Christian, within religious history. Um, Christianity and the, the New Testament seems to be setting the, um, the trend for this. Christianity has always seen history working along uh, under God's uh, rule, uh, looking forward always to the coming of the one whom God is to send. And that figure is seen as Jesus Christ. Yep. Um, there are places in the New Testament where he's seen as, you might say, the culmination of all that has gone before the fulfillment of God's promises that have gone before. 
Uh, and that's why the church has always placed what we call the Old Testament together with the New Testament as earlier evidence. Now, if Jesus is the coordination of God's uh, disclosure of God's self to the world, and parts of uh, the New Testament, and thinking of the prologue of John's Gospel, um, strongly attest to this, then what would God want to add afterwards? Um, why should there be any addition to what is complete and perfect? And so from a doctrinal point of view, it is very difficult to fit Muhammad in to this scheme, this religious scheme. But from as early as the early ninth century, the ninth century, there were Christians living under Islamic rule mm. who regarded Muhammad as an authentic prophet of God, as an authentic messenger of God, who was sent to the Arabs. The Arabs were thought to be particularly impenetrable uh, for, for Christian missionaries. There were Christian missionaries working among the, um, the Bedouin Arabs of the Arabian Peninsula from before the time of Islam. And uh, wow. it seems that the, the pagan Arabs were very, very resistant because of their polytheism. And the, 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 the argument was, and this was represented by Christian bishops, that Muhammad was sent to bring the pagans of the Arabian Peninsula to a simple form of monotheism. Yeah. on the way to the fuller form of monotheism, that is Trinitarian uh, belief. Uh, that, is, that is sometimes adduced through Christian history, uh, but more, most of the time Muhammad is seen as, as an aberrance, until I would say the Enlightenment. And then Muhammad is looked at again, and he seemed to have very positive features. Uh, up until about that time, he was generally seen almost as a demonic force. Uh, and there are chronicles and um, poems from, say, the uh, time of the Crusades, in which he is identified um, as an agent of the devil or as a demon himself. But the, the, the Song of Roland, isn't it? It's a very famous song of Roland, yeah. uh, that, well, that, is, that is where the um, infernal trinity of Apollyon, uh, Temujent, and Mahun um, uh, is, um, is, is referred to, I think, more or less first. Um, but yes, in the 18th century and 19th century, uh, there was a, 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 you might say a softening of this approach, and Muhammad was looked at again, uh, basically because, as you were saying just now, the Quran is translated into English, also early biographies, uh, Muslim biographies in Arabic are translated into English and people can begin to see what Muhammad was doing and yeah. what he was about. Um, I mean, theological reservations still were very strong indeed. But yes, um, even in the 18th century, the people who looked on Muhammad as some sort of hero figure. And in the 19th century, we have Thomas Carlyle. Oh, wow. I was going to say uh, Thomas Carlyle. Oh, his lectures yeah. on heroes and hero yeah. worship. And, and Muhammad he, is one of these figures, uh, great hero. Yeah. Of those heroes, yes. And you know, this really sets shows that there is a, a, a different trend to the dominant trend. Um, the trouble is, for me, that still, if Christ is seen as the, the apex, as the climax um, of God's revelation, then it's very difficult to see what after that can have validity. Now then, weighed against that is the testimony of um, the Quran and also the, the Prophet's Hadith, um, a huge corpus of sayings attributed not to God, the Quran is God's word, Muhammad is seen as only the, um, the channel by which God's word, the eternal word, uh, is manifest to, 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 to the created order. Um, but the hadith of Muhammad's own statements, um, and they were, they, 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 they were um, remembered by his um, companions, and they were finally set down. And there have been stringent um, stringent checks upon them to show which are likely to be 
authentic and which will merge yeah. yeah. But a figure emerges there that is not the warlike, um, womanizing, unrestrained, uncontrolled character um, of polemic, but somebody who is much more thoughtful about the nature of society, the nature of the relationship between the human and God, and the nature of human destiny. Hmm. Oh. Destiny. So it's very yeah. Muhammad, and, and to say that there is no value in the figure or the, um, the teachings that Muhammad gave. Um, how you connect those teachings with the teachings that are recorded from Christ in the New Testament and from the early figures is a matter of ongoing debate, it seems to me. Can I also just add that um, you mentioned the doctrinal difficulties of incorporating Muhammad from a Christian point of view into salvation history, uh, given the uh, statements you mentioned, uh, the prologue in John's Gospel, of course, Paul's Christology and the later councils and creeds, it doesn't seem to there isn't really an opening for any further profit from that point of view, and that's actually true. But then also there has been a lot of, uh, uh, since the, the rise of biblical criticism, uh, as an academic study of the Bible, um, particularly in recent years, I'm thinking of um, as Hans Kuhn, the German scholar who sadly recently passed away. He was a Roman Catholic priest, of course, uh, connected with the Vatican Council. Uh, Second Vatican Council. He, in his work, he has um, uh, quite explicitly seen a connection with the earliest Jewish Christianity uh, that we can um, discover from historical study, and Islamic and Islamic understanding, Islamic Christology or Quranic Christology um, that we see in Islam. And so, in a sense, it's bypassing the later Christian tradition, going back to the earliest sources. And, and uh, Hans Kuhn's not, not alone in, in that regard. There are other uh, scholars, James Tabor, Professor James Tabor, I've had the privilege of speaking to, has also written on this. Uh, and Professor Jeffrey Buck, another American academic, who've written quite a lot on this, centering on the figure of the historical figure of James, the head of the church, Jesus as a Torah observant Jew. And what, what Jesus in that reconstruction taught and preached uh, has many interesting parallels and similarities, they would argue, with. Um, the Islamic understanding or the Quranic understanding, and also even academic works like the New Jerusalem Biblical Commentary, which is the, you know, the, the single volume compendium of uh, Roman Catholic scholarship, official Catholic scholarship, um, in, in its commentary on Matthew's Gospel, actually speaks about the Jewish Christianity that it discusses in Matthew, sees in Matthew, finding um, it being reborn as Islam in the seventh century. Uh, it actually says that. Um, so it's kind of by if you bypass that later tradition and go back to the earliest uh, sources, historical sources about Jesus and his teaching, some scholars, uh, reputable scholars, are seeing a connection with that in the uh, Islamic understanding, and they would say that uh, perhaps because of some hesitancy due to residue Islamophobia amongst Western scholars, these parallels have been overlooked in the last generation or two, um, but they are being rediscovered now and, and analysed. So. That would be another way of rapprochement or bridge building, arguably, between Western Christian historians and uh, the Muslim world. I don't know what you think about that. That's possible. I, I, I think I myself would want to say that um, the teachings of Christianity, uh, the teachings of Jesus, have to be scrutinized and looked at codified uh, for themselves and the teachings of Muhammad and of Islam have to be looked at in the same way. Mm. Um, it, I think it would be very dangerous to try to say that the two figures are quite close to each other. Um, you're right, you know, I agree with you when you say that Jesus is very understandable against the Jewish background of his day. Um, not only were there uh, religious teachers saying things very similar to him, there were also wonder workers and healers doing very similar things to what he was doing. That, uh, that of course, fails to look at the 
individuality and the originality and the startling uh, difference uh, in what Jesus had to say from what uh, was being said by his um, his contemporaries. Um, I think we we could be actually getting rather mistaken if we try to see Jesus and Muhammad as being very similar. Um, what criteria would be used to judge whether you know how we how we judge how how we would make that comparison? Not at all easy. I myself would prefer to say, well, this is Islam. This is Christianity. Christians and Muslims believe different things. Um, they have different perceptions of the same God. I I, I wouldn't have any problem. I do not have any problem with saying Christian Muslim <laughs> the same God. And in many ways, if we look at the morality and ethical teaching of Christianity and Islam, we can find great complementarity. And I think we have to respect Islamic society historically and in the present day uh, for, for, for its integrity um, and for the social sensitivities that are shown that in many ways um, can be examples to Christians. Yeah. But I would, I would find it very difficult to say that Christianity and Islam are different versions of the same thing. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't think anyone's saying that. I think, I think the argument is that an historical reconstruction, uh, going back to the earlier sources, um, suggests... I'm so sorry, uh, you're, you're, you're a little bit away from the microphone. I'm sorry, you? yeah. The, the, I think we are having That's slight good. problems with the reception uh, here. Maybe it's my... Uh, so, um, I, I, I agree with you that Christianity, as Christianity, um, does have these differences and they're, and they're not reconcilable in some ways. I agree with that, of course. Trinitarianism is not compatible, I would argue, with the Quran's understanding of Tawhid. Um, but I, I was talking at the level of historical reconstruction done by Christian scholars um, in, in the West anyway. And and also the perhaps the dominant understanding um, by scholarship in the West that the historical Jesus um, was most li most likely to be understood as a prophet as, a, as an eschatological prophet. Now, this is not Christian faith speaking, this is historical reconstruction speaking. Now, there is a difference, and I understand you're making that difference, but, um, and it, it's at that level of historical reconstruction that we see um, similarities, because Jesus, if Jesus was a prophet, Muhammad was a prophet, and in terms of their core beliefs, in terms of the unity of God, uh, they both believed that Moses was sent by God, uh, that uh, and, and the Hebrew prophets and so on and and that works and faith and con concern for the poor and so there, there a, a much greater area of commonality then than at the official doctrinal level between Catholic faith and or, or Anglican faith and Islamic faith. I I, I, gr I grant you that certainly. I was just a level of historical reconstruction done by scholars like the Catholic Hans Kung and. and um, and others uh, at that level i think there is grounds for uh, convergence but that's not the level of faith that's the level of history perhaps um i i have very little uh, to contend against that I, I suppose i would just want to say that you know we're talking about two figures who were human they were men they lived in particular historical contexts uh, and to call them prophets uh, using the language of their of their day, though I think in a Muslim context and in a Christian context, the word prophet probably means different things. So we have to be careful about that. Um, the problem is that uh, I, I, sorry, I'm losing losing my point now. Um, Yes, we have to rely upon the written records that we have about both Jesus and about Muhammad. And we cannot assume that there is no theological um, overlay over even the earliest records of, that we have of Jesus and of Muhammad. In other words, there are attempts to fit them into a doctrinal context. Now, we may not know that context very well, but we cannot assume that even as early 
as, say, Mark's gospel, which is generally thought to be the earliest gospel, even as early as Mark's gospel, there is no theology. And if no. you look at the letters of Paul, which predate even Mark, we've got a considerably um, sophisticated theology about, about Jesus. Now, the context in which Paul was writing was possibly not the context of, of, of the Jewish um, uh, parts of Palestine. Um, but I don't know whether we can get back to the historical figure of Jesus or we can get back to the historical figure of Muhammad. Um, it's a matter of having to accept certain things on faith. Now, what, what I've said there requires a huge amount of discussion. I'm aware of that. But I, I still would want to say be very careful. Very, maybe I'm more an academic than a believer in this respect. <laughs> So uh, it would be fair to assume, uh, if one can assume these things, that uh, in your view, Muhammad was not a prophet of God because he doesn't fit into the, the Christian understanding of salvation history, as you described uh, just now. Not if it's understood in terms of uh, Jesus being the definitive uh, bringer of salvation. Mm -hmm. No, I haven't said what I think about Muhammad. Um, Sorry, I, I was assuming, but I'm I, 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 inviting you perhaps to correct me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I'm not sure that I would go as far as uh, Keith Ward from what you were just saying. Um, but as I was beginning to say just, just now, uh, when we look at the record that we can see of Muhammad's sayings and the Quran itself, we can see the incredibly, and en well, I can use that word, I hope, enlightened understandings of, say, the place of women. Um, I find when I give talks on Islam, one of the regular questions I receive is, what does, you know, what, why should Islam be so um, anti-woman? And I have to try to say, well, actually, no. if you look at the fundamental sources, the life of Muhammad, the sayings of Muhammad, the Quran itself, there is very, very sophisticated and advanced teaching about the place um, of women. And I think we, we have to recognize that. Um, and, and maybe Christianity has not given credit. So Muhammad was an insightful man. I think I would probably go as far as to, as, as to agree with Thomas Carlyle, Carlyle, who in those um, lectures on heroes and hero worship, called Muhammad a prophetic genius. Um, he likens him to Shakespeare and Milton in uh, the, because of course he regards the Quran as Muhammad's, uh, somehow Muhammad's production, effusion, yeah. um, and he sees Muhammad as a, as a poetical genius. I wouldn't descend from that very far. I would see Muhammad as uh, a very, very unusual figure, mm. uh, a figure who has religious insights and insights insights about human nature and human society that um, are, are comparable with the highest um, teachings and are very rare indeed in the history of humankind. So, so he's a human-inspired human genius, but not a, but not a divine-inspired prophet. So that, uh, sorry, a, a human-inspired genius for sure, but uh, comparable to Milton and Shakespeare in terms of their eloquence and their profundity, but, but not in any way comparable to the Hebrew prophets in terms of their inspiration from the divine. That would be it. But that would be the, the line. Well, I think we're begging questions by saying that the Hebrew prophets were the Hebrew prophets. Um, you know, where does the where where, where does the the, the, the the book called Isaiah come from? Was was he an inspired figure in the sense of receiving his words from God or was he a very canny um, political uh, analyst who was able to talk about the realities of his day, the political realities of his day, um, in ways that gave them a moral uh, structure um, and, and was simply doing, uh, the, at the risk of trivializing, doing what a very canny and um, insightful political commentator to do today would be doing, but in a very different form. Um, so, uh, when we talk about the biblical prophets, and we've got to be very careful, when we talk about Muhammad as a prophet, 
I see Muhammad as, as, as I've just said, as a very insightful analyzer of uh, the way the world is, the way God relates to the world, and the way the human individual is. Uh, almost unique in that way. So. Okay, no, that's fine. I and mean, we finally that we 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 had uh, we spoke for an hour, and, uh, but that perhaps drawing to a close. Uh, would you like uh, I mean, a, a lot of a lot of Muslims watch blogging theology, and um, would you have any final uh, message for them in terms of how you hope the future will develop, or, or uh, uh, how Muslims perhaps could better understand Christian-Muslim relations or Christianity? Do you have anything you'd want to say to Muslims uh, in, in conclusion? Well, thank you very much. Um, I have very deep respect for Muslim welfare organizations, and I think uh, Christians should know more about those to see right. that Muslims uh, do have very strong um, uh, social consciences. I would hope that Muslims could see that Christians aren't all like 19th century missionaries, that there are some Christians who want to know as much about Islam as they possibly can. I yes. want to work alongside Muslims. Um, truth is one. Truth is one. And if Muslims um, can work through their faith and Christians can work through their faith, then we have the possibility of reaching truth together. Yes. Oh, well, that's that's a beautiful message. I, I certainly agree with you. Uh, Muslims and Christians working side by side on, on so many of the world's urgent problems uh, is, is something we can all aspire to. So. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Reverend Professor uh, David Thomas, for your time and your insights and your knowledge and your uh, and, and explaining about the remarkable uh, fragments of the Quran at the University of uh, Birmingham. Absolutely fascinating. Uh, so thank you again very much indeed for your time, sir. Really appreciate it. Thank you. So I've just